Good afternoon. Hello to everyone. Closer? OK. A very warm welcome to everyone to this high-level dialogue of the Collaborative Partnership on Forest on turning the tide on deforestation. My name is Mario Bocucci. I'm the head of the UN Red uh, Program Secretariat and I will be your co-facilitator today. We have an amazing program ahead of us for the next 90 minutes. I will introduce all of the speakers as they take the floor, but I'm sure you know, those in the audience and those online will already recognize them. They are remarkable agents of change and leadership in the quest to turn the tide on deforestation and to make that objective delivered. The next 90 minutes, we are gonna organize us in three moments. The first one, we will hear some framing opening remarks from three speakers. Then we will have a dialogue with uh, six panelists. And then we will have a closing moment to reflect on what we have heard. So the program is packed, but I can assure you it's worth every moment. As we've seen at this COP, forest is an exemplar of climate action, an action that delivers on many other benefits, biodiversity, development, health, and forest is ready to deliver on the ground. We're gonna hear more of how the Collaborative Partnership on Forest, this group of 15 multilateral organization, is ready to help and support all agents of change. With that, I would now like to invite the first uh, speaker to provide the opening remarks. It's Maria Helena Semedo, the chair of the Collaborative Partnership on Forest and she's also the Deputy Director General for Natural Resources at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Maria Elena, please. Thank you, Mario, and uh, good afternoon to all. Dear colleagues, brothers, sisters, members of the Collaborative Partnership, dear participants, very good afternoon to all. The past eight years are said to be the eight warmest on record fueled by ever-rising greenhouse gas concentrations and accumulated heat. This is coupled by a growing food security crisis from increasing food and energy prices. Deforestation rates around the world have declined modestly, but are still too high. Every year, 10 million hectares of forest are lost for other land uses, amplifying climate impacts. 
We are off track to meet the 2030 goals of stopping forest loss and degradation. But we know they are solutions. We need to work across sectors using an inclusive systems approach. We welcome concrete actions launched here at COP27, such as the Forest and Climate Leaders Partnership, the EU Forest Partnership, as well as other new and ongoing collaboration between rainforest nations. As the Prime Minister of Barbados said last week, we have the collective capacity to transform. Indeed, strategic partnership like ours, the Collaborative Partnership on Forest, with its 15 agencies and programs, can help drive needed actions. And we stand ready to support implementation of the Forest and Climate Leaders Partnership and other global forest commitments. For example, FAO together with UNDP and UNEP supports more than 60 countries to reduce deforestation and forest degradation through the UNRED program. Forest countries have submitted more than 11 billion tons of forest emission reduction to the UNFCCC achieved since 2006, equal as much as one third of global fossil carbon dioxide emissions in 2021. FAO and UNEP co-lead the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration through an actionable playbook with 10 principles for ecosystem restoration and collecting and sharing best practices, this global movement aims to inspire and accelerate restoration actions on the ground. At the 15 World Forest Congress held in Seoul last May, the Framework for Ecosystem Restoration Monitoring Platform was launched to improve data access, transparency, to monitor progress of restoration commitment guided by the best available science. This is a very important tool, how we can monitor our progress. And in response to the United Nations Secretary General's call, the Collaborative Partnership on Forest will soon unveil a global action plan to turn the tide on deforestation. Dear participants, dear friends, as the climate crisis escalates towards critical tipping points, transforming agri-food system must become a top priority for the future of humanity. This year, for the first time, both FAO committees on agriculture and forest with high-level representatives in agriculture and forestry provided guidance on how to increase synergies between agriculture and forestry. And I would like to thank the members of the Collaborative Partnership who attended the two committees and provided their contribution. And on building sustainable global agri-food system that provide a win-win outcome for both sectors and for food and forestry security. Creating such synergies is essential to manage interconnected trade-offs involved in ending hunger, halting deforestation, combine, combining climate change, land degradation, desertification, and biodiversity loss. Friends, the last two weeks, we have heard encouraging announcement and pledge. We have no time to lose before the typing points make climate impacts irreversible. We must take action now, together, to achieve forest and climate goals and tackle our climate, food, energy, biodiversity, and livelihood crisis. Thank you, and looking forward to our discussion today. Many thanks, Deputy Director General of FAO, Maria Elena Semedo, for framing in such a compelling way the system change that needs to happen and how the multilateral system and the UN system is committed uh, to support. Thank you so much again, Maria Elena.
Now we're going to show a short uh, video uh, from uh, Mr. Li Junhua. He is the United Nations Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs. If you can please start the video. A warm welcome to this important dialogue. Today, I wish to highlight for you the critical importance of healthy forests to ensuring that we meet the broader development goals that we have set as an international community. We cannot address deforestation without recognizing its links to the poverty, industrial development, food and energy needs, and we certainly cannot divorce it from the impact of the climate change. The loss of the forest cover caused by deforestation undermines our efforts to fight climate change as it slows the pace of carbon absorption. Deforestation is a significant contributor to the greenhouse gas emissions and the biodiversity loss. The 2030 Agenda and the Paris Agreement both highlight the need to hold deforestation and ensure sustainable management of the world's forests and the UN Strategic Plan for Forest 2030 seeks to accelerate those efforts Last year, many countries also agreed on the Glasgow Declaration on Forests and Land Use as an important initiative to address deforestation. Dear colleagues, we must upscale our actions to implement the UNSPF and achieve its global forest goals. It is critical that the Global Environment Facility and the Green Climate Fund include the implementation of UNSPF as eligible activities for funding. We must also take the momentum from today into the 2023 SDG Summit and address deforestation as a key factor for making progress towards the SDGs. In this light, we welcome the ongoing efforts by the Collaborative Partnership on the Forests to develop a joint initiative on turning the tide on deforestation. I look forward to seeing this translate into concrete actions integrated into the operational programs of CPF members. As a member, and the Secretariat of the Partnership, we in UNDESA stand ready to support and jointly advance the work of the partnership. Thank you. And thank you also for these words. I think that very important to remind us how forest solutions are crucial also to deliver on the SDGs. They are the foundation for development. Now we have heard these first two uh, opening remarks from two leaders in the United Nations system. And now I would like to invite to the podium a very dear colleague who has been leading on forest in her own country, Ghana, Rosalind Ajay. She is the director of the Climate Department at the Forestry Commission of Ghana. And uh, many of you will have seen her very active here. She's also been the Sherpa to the co-chair of the Forest and Climate Leadership Platform. And uh, she's really led the way to position Ghana as a leader in addressing uh, deforestation and in supporting other countries doing the same. Rosalind. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, Mario. A very pleasant evening to everybody here. And I hope nobody here is tired of me because I've been on a number of panels and said many things, but um, the message and the goal has been the same for forest, for forest, and for forest. Today I'm wearing white. Back home in Ghana, when you wear white, it signifies victory because largely I believe that COP27 has been victorious for why I came here. And the forest agenda has been so strong on different fronts. And thank you so much to the organizers of this high-level event for having me. And I look forward to a day where we celebrate forests even beyond such gatherings and get into the actual spaces where the action is. For some time now, I've moved away from conventional speeches, so please pardon me if I say anything that is not expected. But I believe we need to tell the truth and tell it as it is. And I am very happy for the opportunities that Ghana has had together with other countries that are saying the same message. Special thanks to the UK government, to the US, to the FAO, to UNDP, to the Nature Conservancy, and also to other private sector entities who have had us on panels. Many years ago, the discussion on forests and forest carbon seemed blurry. There was a lot of skepticism as to how it would work, what methodologies to apply, and how to ensure permanence, additionality, and avoid leakage. 14 years down the line, countries like Ghana, Costa Rica, Mozambique, and others have demonstrated that it is possible and the frameworks exist to reduce deforestation and forest degradation and to quantify the value of seeing. From Red Plus readiness through to implementation, Ghana has launched a 20-year Red Plus strategy, developed a safeguards information system, estimated its reference levels, developed the institutional architecture for monitoring, transparency, and accountability, and has also developed robust and inclusive landscape governance structures that promote broad level stakeholder engagement and participation, all through participatory and consultative processes. This has been made possible by the support of our many stakeholders, including particularly local communities, private sector, NGOs, CSOs, traditional authorities, and governments working in concert. And today, we await our very first payment from the Carbon Fund through the World Bank for our first Red Plus credits issuance for the reporting period 2019. Our Red Plus strategy has a jurisdictional approach to implementation. And I was very happy when Ms. Maria Helena yes, I got the name right, spoke about the nexus between agriculture and forest, because that's what we are doing back home in Ghana, having a Red Plus program that focuses on forest restoration and also increasing agricultural productivity. We are working within our cocoa landscapes to reduce expansionist cocoa activities, increase cocoa yields, ultimately increasing the yields means increasing the income for farmers, and then also putting in place robust measures to restore our forest. We believe this is tangible, this is real forest action. And so the discussion on turning the tide is no longer abstract. There are practical working examples in practical physical spaces. For us, the next big issue or the next big pieces which we believe would help to replicate and scale such action, is to let finance flow. And finance flow with speed, and I emphasize with speed, to those who are generating emission reductions. It is to let finance, other than resource-based payments, flow for governance arrangements and fund flow mechanisms for benefit sharing. A benefit sharing plan is only a plan on paper there has to be a functional fund flow mechanism that drives the flow of funds 
two beneficiaries who have demonstrated performance. The other next big piece is to understand that forest carbon pricing is not static. It is not $5 nor $10. The real integrity of forest carbon is to unpack the total cost of generation, the total cost of what forest loss is going to look like, and it is to unpack on a country by country or case by case basis. The next big piece is to have a system of trust where the demand side doesn't just operate in a space of requirements after requirements but collectively, through trust, works with the supply side to hold hands and to work it out step by step towards a desired, not a perfect destination. We might get there someday, but a desired destination, while recognizing and rewarding the many years of efforts, 10 years, 14 years, 12 years for some countries, on Red Plus implementation, it's phenomenal. It is work that must be recognized and rewarded. It is for such a reason that Ghana has been an active player in the FACT dialogue initiated by the UK COP26 presidency. To have both producers and consumer countries work through actions that reduce deforestation in supply chains. That is why Ghana is part of the FCLP the Forest and Climate Leaders Partnership, a delivery vehicle for the 2030 Glasgow Leaders Declaration on Forest Loss and Land Use Targets. Setting targets or making declarations without delivery vehicles is baseless. The FCLP, as a non-negotiating or governance space, is transformative and phenomenal, as it makes room for high-level political dialogue on the support needed for forest and land use interventions to work towards celebrating success by 2030 and keeping 1.5 alive. On this personal note, I spoke for Ghana, now it's my own note. And recognizing the mission of the Collaborative Partnership on Forest, I make a personal call to all countries to support the FCLP. The CPF mission talks about countries and all forest types. It doesn't talk about big countries or big forest types. What Ghana is doing is significant, as well as what Brazil is doing, as well as what Colombia is doing. Can we all come together? Can we support each other in this space? The discussion on forest has never been so pronounced, but we can only keep the momentum when we keep working together. When I speak for Ghana, it should reflect the voice of Uganda. It should reflect the voice of the UK. Can small countries provide some learnings to big countries? I think it's possible. Can big countries set the pace for small countries to have entry points to learn from them? It's also possible. There is a huge potential for collaboration and learning. And the value and need for collective action to achieve our climate goals and targets can't be overemphasized. Finally, I end by asking, and I don't expect any responses now, but just for reflection. Is there anyone here who will not push for the text that will come out of COP27 to feature forest or Red Plus? Because I think there is a disconnect. When we have such high level engagements and side events, same countries that speak for forest have colleagues within negotiating rooms who are not willing and ready to have forest in the text. Is it just for the fun of it? I do not think so. We need to have a rethink. When we gather for COP events, it is for climate action. And if we are not reflecting the same in the regulatory framework that comes out of COP, then we need to rethink why we are here. Because there is simply no 1.5 degrees without forest. The message is that simple. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Rosalind. You said at the beginning, will you be 
bored of tired of hear me never and you just <laughs> explained why i think you've you know laid out very clearly a game plan a vision that is grounded on the reality of the victory that you have achieved but they need to scale them up with speed so this was I am sure very inspiring for all of the panelists and for everyone in the audience. And I really like now to turn to the second part of this discussion so that we can take on the questions and reflections that uh, Rosalind, you've put forward uh, to us. So we're now moving to the second part of this event where we're gonna have a dialogue with our panelists, and I'm now going to introduce them. From my right, Susan Gardner. She is the director of the Ecosystem Division at UNEP. Then Maria Elena Semedo, who I introduced earlier, the deputy director general of FAO. Next to her, Elizabeth Merema, the executive secretary of the CBD. And next to Elizabeth, Shiam Satkuru, the Executive Director of the International Tropical Timber Organization. Next to Elizabeth, Juliette Biao Kodenokpo. She is the Director of the Secretariat of the UN Forum on Forests. And to her right, Donald Cooper, the Director of the Transparency Division at UNF Triple C. So what we're going to do in this part of uh, the dialogue, we really would like to unpack concretely what does it take to go from here to turning the tide on deforestation for real, delivering at the same time on climate, on biodiversity, on development, and we're going to look at that from three lenses. What are the priorities? What are concretely the solutions that we have at hand? And what investment is needed and how to unlock it? And we will reflect on this from the perspective of the multilateral system and the UN system that forms the Collaborative Partnership on Forest. So if you are all ready with that plan, <laughs> we're going to start with Elizabeth Merema. And really, your views on what can concretely the Collaborative Partnership on Forest do? What can the CPF offer to this cause. Elizabeth, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I thought uh, the answer had already been, the question had been answered by the previous speakers. Mm -hmm. But since I have to say a few words, I will do my best. First, from the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity, or CBD, we sincerely welcome this collaborative partnership on dialogue. And the previous speaker put it rightly, without forest, there can be no 1.5 degrees centigrade in order to turn the tide uh, on deforestation. So recognizing the experience of the collaborative partnership and the important role in contributing to the implementation, particularly of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework to be adopted next month at our conference of the party uh, in less than three weeks from here. For me, I think all of us as member organizations of the collaborative, we need to join forces to focus, I'll say probably on four points or so. One and key is halting deforestation in terms of avoiding and reversing the loss and degradation of carbon and species rich ecosystems on land as well as in the ocean, which is of highest importance for combined biodiversity protection and climate change mitigation actions with a large adaptation core benefits. 
to forest ecosystem restoration, which involves planting trees in ecosystem areas where historically there have been no forest, and reforestation with monocultures, especially with exotic tree species that can contribute to climate change mitigation. Of course, we know at times uh, we need also to be careful because they can also be detrimental to biodiversity. So we need to be clear that the benefits are for adaptation. Three, sustainable forest management, basically emphasizing on, ma on management of biodiversity for long-term sustainability and recognizing the importance of ecosystem functions and interaction across forested landscape. And four, to strengthen the engagement of indigenous peoples and local communities in land management and government strategies. It has clearly been proven that indigenous land management, recognizing the indigenous rights to land, have been efficient in the conservation, particularly of old growth uh, grown forest. So halting and reversing deforestation really need to be our urgent global priority for tackling the biodiversity and climate crises in order to achieve the sustainable development goals. And the post-2020 global biodiversity framework does provide an important roadmap for catalyzing actions and enhancing the needed synergies. We know forests are 31% of the global terrestrial uh, surface, literally about 4 billion hectares, and are extremely important for global biodiversity. So I will repeat uh, what our previous colleague said. Without forests, there's no biodiversity. And without biodiversity, we are saying there's no food, we eat, there's no air, we breathe, there's no water, we drink, there's no storage for carbon, and therefore there will be no life at the end of the day. Thank you. <laughs> Many thanks, uh, Elizabeth, absolutely. The no forest, no biodiversity, and forest also is a key climate solution, and the rubric of the four actions, conserve, restore, sustainably manage, and do that through, with indigenous people and local communities because they are the one on the forest frontier where every day forest is conserved, restored, sustainably managed. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Having set these priorities, we're now gonna zoom in a little bit on concrete solutions. And that brings me to Susan Gardner, <laughs> the director of the ecosystem division of UNEP to tell us about what you see as solutions. Well, thanks, Mario. And uh, I, my appreciation also to Rosalind for wearing white today in, uh, in indication of victory, because I think it's so important for us to be thinking in terms of progress. And so, Mario, you're framing this around solutions, um, helps us to envision that pathway forward and ensure that, as Varslin said, this isn't abstract, but we do need to build trust. We do need to transition into implementation, as we've heard since the first day of this COP, to ensure that this is about action. And I think one of the ways that we build trust around actions is to have really clear goals and be very specific about what we want to achieve. Something as clear as saying, we're gonna get a gigaton of emission reductions from forests by 2025. That is not ambiguous. We know what we need to do. And we know that this, is, this kind of ambition is part of the solution. This is how we get to having the full potential for forests to help with mitigation in the longer term. Now we've set a few milestones on that and that's important to keep us to our commitments to keep us moving forward. We know that on the Green Gigaton Challenge, we are not currently uh, keeping pace with our milestones. So we had envisioned having a gigaton 
um, by 2025, and really we've only gotten to about a quarter of the way that we needed to be by now. So we have a lot more that we have to do. And if we fail to achieve the milestones by 2025, then how are we going to place ourselves in a good position to succeed for our longer term goals? The emission gap report tells us we have a very short window of time. The window is closing to be able to turn this around. So it's about action and it's about action now. And we have some models we can use. We can replicate for forests what has been successful in other sectors like the energy sector, which was really about having a recipe of combining a fair high carbon price together with predictable demand. If we do that, and we have a needs-based finance, we can have fair and functioning markets that work. But we know this needs to be something that actually is realistic. So something, a minimum of 30 to $50 per ton for supporting forest countries that are attempting to restore and preserve and sustainably manage their forests for the benefit of everyone, for everyone's benefit. And so we need to make sure that it's a price that's viable, that makes this realistic, that it's possible. And that there's the predictability that allows them to be investing now for what they know has to be done over the long term. And let me just be clear about one thing as well. When we're talking about private sector purchases of nature-based solutions as part of offsets to reach net zero, which is so immediately important, we have to make sure that's done at the same time that we are not weakening in any way the deep, rapid decarbonization. That needs to proceed full pace. But it also has to be done, nature-based solutions must be done in accordance with social and environmental safeguards, along with the rights of indigenous people and local community, because that's the solution. That's how it works. And we know that there's some good examples of how you do this. The IUCN has some good examples. The Cancun safeguards from Red Plus. We know how to do this, so these are not mysteries. They are science-based, and we can get there. Integrity in this market is so important. Voluntary carbon markets, when you consider that these markets have quadrupled just between 2020 and 2021 to almost $2 billion, and this was mostly coming from forest credits, so this is essential. As long as we have concrete rules how to do this, we can continue to build that trust. We saw great traction at COP26 with the Glasgow's leader declaration on forests and land use, and we celebrated that with good reason. We just last week saw the Forest Climate Leaders Partnership, and that's something to be wearing white about. We're making great progress. Now's the time to move forward and have ensure that these words have action to build the trust, to build the confidence. Nature is the best investment, we know this the best investment we could possibly make in building our economies and building resilience and human well-being and living in harmony with nature. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Susan. Absolutely, right? To build trust, we have to be concrete, have very concrete targets. One gigaton, a price that is at the right level, I think $30 is a number I could see <laughs> Rosalind also nodding. And time is of the essence. Therefore, finance needs to flow at scale. But at the same time, reminding us that we are talking about nature-based solutions, not nature-based excuses. So what happens in forests is complementary to decarbonization taking place uh, elsewhere. With that, we're now going to move to our third speaker who's going to zoom in more in terms of solutions and funds. This is uh, Siam Satkuru. She is the executive director of the International Tropical Timber Organization. Siam, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much, Mario, and also to all the distinguished speakers on this panel for giving me also the privilege of being with them. Solutions. Why are forests considered an important solution? Tropical forests constitute 45% of the global forest area. They are also home to 40% of global population, and they house 70%
of the global population who live in extreme poverty. IGTO's member countries account for 80% of global tropical forest areas, and these members account for 90% of the trade in forest products. Forests produce the oxygen that we breathe. As they grow, and when sustainably managed, forests play multiple roles. They are carbon sequesters. They are carbon sinks. And they also serve the purpose through sustainable production and consumption as substitution materials for less environmentally friendly materials such as steel, plastics, aluminum, and even fossil fuels, I dare say. Forests are the most effective nature-based solutions when sustainably managed because they provide security and enrichment of livelihoods, including local communities and indigenous populations. Who can actually deny that forests are central to the discussions on climate change? Yet I have to agree with Madame from Ghana where is the discussion on forest this year in COP27? There was some focus at COP26. The ITTO was equally active at COP26, flying the flag particularly for tropical forestry while we were also talking about forests. It just seems that the interface between forests and climate change has somehow disappeared off the radar this year. It's excellent, it's excellent that parties here are talking about adaptation, mitigation, loss and damage, focus on sustainable agriculture, yes, gender, extremely yes, particularly for gender equality and equity in access to everything that we are being done here, and also response measures. But from what we have seen from the last four days, forests are hidden, they are blurred. They are blurred. The interchange between forests and climate change is just being lost in the discussions and the negotiations. And dare I ask, is this a mishap? I hope it's not deliberate to marginalize forestry because sustainably managed forests are also homes to biodiversity, as Madame Marima Marima said and tropical forests houses the most mega diverse biodiversity hotspots in the world. What tropical forests need in order to move forward on this agenda actually is immediate investments. Everyone declares, everyone agrees that the time is now, it's urgent. It has taken too long. And the longer we wait, the longer and the higher the risk we face at losing these forest resources, particularly when the forests are not in a position to yield the value that they can. They will then lose out to competing land users that have a shorter rotation on economic and financial returns, particularly agricultural products. Fast, two-year, three-year harvest. Forestry, even for fast-growing species, minimum seven to 10 years. So it's a challenge. At the same time, I dare also say that sustainably managed forests are the most powerful and effective nature-based solutions, particularly because forests have the potential to absorb up to four gigatons of carbon per annum. There is no other natural resource in the world that can boast that quality. So in terms of finance, we need to first secure the financial pledges before we talk about how we channel those financial resources. The, the financial pledges needs to come through political commitment and through parties who are here. ITTO's 75 member countries are also party to the UNFCCC negotiations, and undoubtedly, they are also party to the CBD COP15 upcoming negotiations in Montreal. ITTO would also urge not just its 75 members, but the 190 plus parties to both conventions to please ensure that the forest resources are given the prominence that they deserve, particularly because 
sustainably managed forests are capable and will provide sustainable food, water, energy, and livelihoods security for the future. All this funding needs to be channeled through international organizations who have experience of implementing projects on the ground. This will be the action that needs to be taken. Of course, this implementation needs to be monitored and closely monitored through credible systems in order to provide confidence to investors who wish to come in for the long run. Because unfortunately, forestry is a long-term commitment. Or should I say, fortunately, forestry is a long-term commitment, purely because they are the ones that provide the oxygen in the air for our lungs to breathe in. I think I might stop here until somebody asks another question. Thank you, Mario. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shiam. Again, forest as the most effective and powerful of nature-based solution, they need immediate finance, and they need more prominence going forward to deliver on their full potential. I think this is a very good reflection to take us to our next speaker, Juliette Biao. She is the UNFF Secretariat Director. And Juliette, your reflections on how do we take it forward? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mario. Uh, it is a great honor to be <laughs> part of this panel, uh, this very well gender balanced panel. <laughs> I think uh, um, we are here today to celebrate, I think, uh, the progress made by the collaborative partnership on forests. But at the same time, we are here to see how we can come together. And uh, it was well summarized by my sister from Ghana that we can only keep the momentum on forests only if we come together. And I think it is fair to recognize that the Collaborative Partnership on Forests, CPF, has made a progress. The ongoing uh, um, uh, effort of the CPF on the joint statement to turn the tide on deforestation is a big step toward achieving the, the global forest goal. But if we are to upscale and accelerate the progress on turning the tide on deforestation, there are four elements that we need to really uh, give consideration to. These uh, elements are clear plan, robust policy, strengthen, uh, increase finance, we, um, the distinguished uh, pre previous speakers spoke about it, but also strengthen international partnership and cross-sectoral uh, coordination. First, we need a clear plan that guides us toward turning the tide on deforestation. And that is really to focus on the internationally agreed framework in particular, the UN Strategic Plan on Forests and its, its global forest goals. It is so important that we need this framework even when we start reporting on our progress toward achieving the global forest goals. Because this framework is the one that guides our work on uh, forest-related work within the UN system. Why are we reinventing the wheel? This is where we should be looking at. But so I, I really want to urge the CPF member organization to urgently and fully integrate the UN strategic plan and forest goal in their operational uh, plan. Second, we need to step up our efforts in supporting countries on their national uh, policy frameworks 
and capacity to implement, uh, or for implementation, while at the same time making sure that they have access to technology, they have access to capacity building, they have access to uh, climate and forest finance, which uh, uh, the predecessor, my uh, this uh, previous speakers talked about. Third, we need to increase finance, and I will not talk about the, the solution provided by my, the previous speaker. Rather, I will talk about the global forest, facilita forest facilitation network, which it's, uh, it's one of, uh, of the tools that uh, uh, we at DESA in, in the UNFF, we use to support countries uh, through the design of the, na the national uh, forest financing uh, strategy. But we need, we need the CPF to really uh, be deeper involved in our work on, on, on GTPFN. That is uh, the only tool that will help us to focus on multilateral uh, um, uh, financial resources, but also it will help us to use effectively the existing resources. And fourth is uh, forest governance at national, regional, and international level. We need, we need to really increase that. We need also, you know, every CPF member talk about private sector involvement. Have we come collectively to, dis to discuss what it does take? We know that the private sector will look into the uh, uh, financial resource on investment. But we talk more and more about social return on investment. How do we incentivize the philanthropy, the stakeholder, the, the uh, uh, major group and stakeholders who have to respond to the need of the countries and also to kind of bridge uh, the, the global and the local level? We hope at UNFF that uh, the Preparation for the, um, the uh, evaluation of the international effectiveness of the international arrangement on forests will provide more opportunities for us as a collaborative uh, platform for forests to come together and move toward turning the tide on deforestation. I thank you. Many thanks. Uh, Juliette, again, for sharing your experience and your very important vantage point. And this rubric, clear plans, finance, governance, capacity building. I think these themes have come up many meetings and discussions uh, in these days. And so thank you so much for presenting them in such a clear way. Now, our final panelist for this session is Donald Cooper. He is the Director for Transparency at UNFCCC. And uh, we all know that UNFCCC staff here are perhaps some of the busiest uh, <laughs> people on campus, so we're very grateful you were able to make the time and to share your reflection with us. Donald, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it is uh, interesting being at the uh, end of a very long line, talking to people who are sitting in very comfortable cinema seats that recline a little bit. But it is also refreshing um, to hear the different perspectives. See, I have a fairly unique one. Under the Paris Agreement, there is already a full set of agreements on forests, on the mitigation effects and what is sought for, and the rules of governance of how parties should uh, behave. And these rules have a functioning mechanism, red plus, 
you heard Donna speak, and at the end she said, waiting for results-based payment. Well, the certification of those results-based payments are done under the convention uh, by the Red Plus mechanism, which fortunately my division is the one that manages. So it has a working functional system of parties quantifying, reporting, having verified their forestry resources that they are putting forward for some management action. And also, it has a mechanism of rewarding them for taking those actions and paying cash. This system works. At the moment, about 80 developing countries are in the process of preparing such systems simply because it did work for the first set of countries who made their submissions. Hundreds of millions of dollars paid out to parties for the preservation of their forests. This also has a lot of co-benefits which don't need to be negotiated. If you preserve the forests or manage them in an environmentally sustainable way, then you have desertification co-benefits and you have biodiversity co-benefits. Without having to have included them as a part of the transaction or having to justify them. You also have covered some of the basic costs which means that local communities, indigenous people, cities, governments can then take further action to maximize the return for those individuals who live near, rely on, or find value in those forests. What can be done to maximize this? Predictability. Ensuring that funding is predictably available for whenever governments make their results-based requests for payments. Ensuring that the partnerships that are possible are not limited. In other words, the Green Climate Fund, the GEF, the European Union, private sector, philanthropies, yes, all of them should be welcomed to make contributions to governments who are taking those actions in preserving their forests. One of the issues we have encountered is that there are so many complicated relationships surrounding forests that we are often skipping around the complications, making it much more difficult to get to the end point that we all want to get to. Forests and the associated areas, which if I said them would cause even more problems, there are no money issues. There is almost too much money. But fortunately, one of the things that is very clear, the parties who have been preparing Red Plus submissions have been doing a remarkable job. There is no question of credibility, no question of the quality of the submissions, and no question when it comes to evaluating the payments that are required as a result of those actions. Quality results. So one of the things I am looking forward to is receiving a lot more and a lot more expansive requests from developing countries for their Red Plus activities in the management, enhancement, maintenance of their forests, and to be in a position to certify even larger payments for those actions taken, and to be able to count on the benefits to biodiversity and desertification that comes from those actions. Thank you. Many thanks, Donald, uh, as always. Uh
very inspiring uh, reflection. There's a system that is functional. It's leading to rewards. In order to scale it up, as you said, unlimited partnership and predictability of finance are gonna be two critical ingredients to get to quality results at scale. Thank you so much. So the panel here has explored and laid out the landscape of actions, priorities, solutions that are in front of us that we really would like to see massively scaled up on the ground, massively scaled up finance. It's a journey. It's a journey where we would like all of us to be able to wear a white shirt in the not too distant future. And as we've heard from all panelists, it's a journey that we can only succeed working together and working together also with indigenous people and local communities. And so this brings us to our final speaker for today. I would like to invite to the podium, Ms. Jessica Vega Ortega. She's the co-chair of the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus an indigenous mixed tech from the community of San Miguel, Awawatitlan. I hope I did justice, I've been practiced with you, <laughs> in the state of Oaxaca in Mexico. Please, Jessica, you have the floor. Thank you. Bishabu for this introduce myself when my name of than my Tom. Thank you everybody, thank you all the panelists, thank you um, for this opportunity to take the bus. I want to uh, start in to tell in part of the, my story and to tell in part about the, my situation and my community but also in the communities. 2,000 acres in one week only for my rayon where it the effects of the climate. Did made it in morbid in the fast way. The calling to action we are difficult because of the trees we are the only ones of the far population. Does not have an equipment and the traditional practices practices are begin overturned by all demanding the mother earth is the life. Because the fire the fire is not only the fate of the trees or the animals animals, but also of the land or the new generations. They are losing the, the biodiversity. And really speaking only on my tongue, because I know this story, we are living not only in my community. This story is for a lot of communities and indigenous people. But today, they had present the, the people from my name or my tongue. This one and a meet is a one place surrounded by a wet tree. And the problem is that I be lost in them. The water continue, the water continue to disappear, and the also the land don't produce it the same. But also, I am lead and the one part of the other community. The name is Valle de Hico Solidarity. And this is the one I meant, Belly Tom. And here, as a loss, also trees and the effects is the loss, the lakes. As I mentioned, this story repeat the, this is the one concern for indigenous youth. Because it's not only lost the trees, it's only lost part of the identities. The face of the climate continue to advance. At the same time, we need to try to advance the solution base for the naturals. Continue to try to be one vision, holistic perspective. 
because it's necessary put focus in the different problems like the one people lost one tree. We cannot prevent the same big fires, but we can to try to prevent the deforestation that they only carried out by capitalist system. This is the one also thinking uh, because the people want to preserve the humanity, but for the, to try to preserve the humanity, we need to think it no individual persons. We need to think in the one cosmovision person and the collective persons. Of course, we want to good nutrition and not get sick anymore. But when there are one who say the, the make it mother air sick, when the, the people create ideas or the popular these ideas, like the sun beans is good or the apple is perfect or the something thing is good for the healthy. And then starting the new deforestation because the people want produce like the, for the produce on the mon, uh, I don't want to see it, monoculture like the seed because the companies use one thinking and sell and they had money. But the, this is the one situation also, the deforestation and the communities. But this is the one example for destroying the planet. I had more examples like this, like the, um, like the, the people to try to disappear the communities for hard the new land for the planting. So we need to see how to improve it action in the positive way for the good nutrition, for the good production, for the good health, for the good environment. I what we need are more examples for the good practice and not for the bad problems. That is what I am would you like to remember that the, in the modern social city we say it, so solidarity needed. We need solidarity. We know they are not, the climate justice is not possible if we know thinking in the human rights. But also needed to thinking about the fry priority and informing consent for indigenous people, right? For the right for the food security and the recovering to thinking about the promise for the agenda 2030. Because stay in the middle, but no see the good advances. As indigenous youth, we are recognizing the forcing for the people, for the sector, for the youth agencies like the FAO. But I want to invite to you support the, this achievement for the to try to have these global goals and this promise, promise to be in action in the community's levels. Let's go to potential this is forcing and not continue losing the biodiversity. Please, let's be medicine for the mother earth. The mother earth need all of the, the people to working together for the protection them because they are given the more beautiful and they give the more aspiring for to, to continue preserve the humanity and the biodiversity. Thank you everybody for listening to me and thank you everybody for all esforcing to make it together. Jessica, it is us that we thank you deeply. I think you know, you've brought a very powerful testimony. People, people, people at the center. Humanity, solidarity, rights. You've really made it very clear and very tangible 
for us, and as you said, to bring the actions at the community level and be that the medicine for Mother Earth. Again, thank you so much. We are in very good time, and I assure you that has got nothing to do having a moderator that has been based in Switzerland for many years. <laughs> this is thanks to all of the colleagues who have been working uh, on uh, co-organizing, and I would like to recognize here Ami De Shell from FAO on the floor, and many, many others in Rome and at FAO offices. So we have about 12 minutes <laughs> where we're good to do another round. We don't have 12 minutes, yep. We <laughs> Absolutely. So maybe we, rather than going to another round of quick uh, reactions from the panelists, very good. This is co-generation of uh, a session where I see from some puzzled faces we may not have a, a floating microphone, but one will be soon procured. <laughs> <laughs> or we can use. So first, let me check, is there anyone from the audience who would like to share a reflection, a comment, has a question, a take home message? And you don't have to feel the pressure to do that. And if I see no hands coming up, then maybe then we can continue with the round from the panelists. But if anyone would like to intervene at this point, or at any point, just raise your hands. I'll keep my eyes on the audience. We have one? There you go. <laughs> Am I? <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you for this uh, tremendous panel and uh, all um, the great ideas that came out of this panel regarding the solutions uh, in particular. Um, I, I see that uh, I am from the Jeff. Sorry, I could have presented myself first, uh, and a part of the CPF. Uh, so it's very great to to, to be part of this um, team and this dream. I would say too. Uh, I think it's the first, the third time that we have this uh, event on turning the tide of on the on deforestation, and we all are all very keen on presenting all what we are doing and and the solutions that are already being implemented, but still. As uh, um, Mr. Semedo uh, uh, um, said, uh, we are still losing much forest. So uh, maybe uh, I would like to, to hear also from, from this uh, extraordinary panel uh, what they think about uh, the, the most important bottlenecks. What prevent us to get to the results? Because we know the solutions, we have some means, we have a very great team uh, in the CPF. So what prevent us to go beyond and, and, and finally achieve uh, the result that we are trying to, to achieve. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very useful comments from the GF colleagues, as always. And here we have another hand up. Please, um, can you pass, or I can do that. Hi, everybody. My name is Barbara Beltran. Uh, I have an NGO. It's called Green Dreams, and I educate people. I educate young people, high schools in Peru. I'm doing my PhD also uh, about deforestation in the Amazonia, Amazonias uh, and about the palm oil because uh, it's deforestating right now our uh, Amazonas region in Peru. Almost 30% comes from the, um, this monocultive right now. So I would like to, to ask you, how can we make this awareness among, for example, students or the normal local people from the capital who is not living in the in the Amazonas region, for example, sometimes we ignore that and we don't know because maybe uh, the media doesn't give this uh, uh, importance for the local communities or uh, indigenous peoples. So in your perspective, what are the solutions, the social solutions to all everybody's uh, cross-sectoral cross to work together for that? F actually, young people in Latin America, we, we are so many people, but we don't engage. So I think it's going to be also a good opportunity to, to make some noise. Thank you. 
And thank you very much. Uh, again, very useful uh, comment and question. And now, seeing, checking if there's any other reflection. Yes, we have more hands. Uh, good evening. My name is Venta Mongera. I, I work with Africa Biodiversity Network. We are in 21 countries, whereby we work with various communities. One of the key functions that uh, we uh, work on is around conservation of ecosystem services. And this discussion, all this uh, panel has responded to most of the questions that I've been having at the back of my mind from our partners in Central and West Africa in regards to um, um, activities, destructive activities that have been happening in their forest and how to take care of that. So this session has been very um, informative and I'm sure I'll be dropping some emails to ask for support on how we can collaborate to help our brothers and sisters and communities in those countries. Thanks so much. Thank you. Many thanks. And uh, at the back of the room. Yes, um, thank you. My name is Jeff. I come from the Republic of Liberia in West Africa, one of the heavily endowed biological diversity communities. I'm glad that we have uh, Elizabeth in this hall today. We are heading to COP15. From some of our countries, the message we want to continue to bring forth to each and every one of us is that the three real conventions, one leaving the rest behind and assume that we are fighting a real fight against climate change, I think it's a shared error. The three of them will have to go in line. We are from the Upper Guinea forest where we owe 43%. We just completed our forest inventory and realized that we have over 2,000 endemic species. All of these are required to be conserved. We are working towards 30 by 30 and all of the international conventional conditions. In the absence of resources, how possible is it that we are going to conserve and preserve biodiversity? Some of our people are forest-dependent communities. From their birth up to the ages they have reached, their source of income has been their forest. So to go today and say we will have to adapt to new technology, you can imagine the challenges associated therewith. Secondly, CBD is one of the earlier um, conventions under the United Nations. But you will realize that the momentum towards CBD is not as wide as it is towards ENF C today. We need to begin to look at that very carefully. So as you all converge in Montreal for COP15, I hope the outlook for this convention will take a new direction. On a serious note, let me conclude by saying, those of us who are rainforest nations, biodiversity conserved nations, this is the last hope that we have. And if absolutely nothing is being done, you can rest assured to control forest dependent community is going far beyond our reach. Thank you. Many thanks. Uh, excellent uh, uh, points and questions. Uh, checking if there's any other question and with my fellow. <laughs> All right, so, and Ami, we, Ami, sorry, just a, before I turn to the panel, just to check, okay. So we have a few minutes before uh, closing. This leaves us uh, the opportunity for a final uh, round to address uh, you know, the, the comments we have harvested from the audience, which you know, all of us have been in many of these meetings. They resonate with all of the comments we hear everywhere. 
They are about bottlenecks, good practices, awareness, especially for the youth, how to increase collaboration, means of implementations, also when it comes to the three Rio conventions, and many more. So what I suggest, perhaps, if we, uh, perfect, we can go in any order you prefer. I see Juliette is uh, ready, and then whoever wants to go next, pass the baton, and then we will be Th Thank you closing. very much, uh, Mario. I, I, I want to try to respond to the question uh, asked by um, my friend, uh, Pascal. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned in my, uh, in my uh, presentation, I think uh, to respond to your question, what do we need to do better? You cannot achieve anything if you don't have a reference, if you don't have a compass, you cannot achieve it. You cannot measure your progress towards achieving your goal if you don't have reference. The UN strategic plan on forests is international agreed framework. But <laughs> when it's come to work, working together we, uh, as a CPF member, how many of for the CPF member organization have integrated it in the, in, in the operation and program? We need to, to, to really integrate because the UNS uh, strategic plan on forests and its goal is not only to achieve the, forest, the global forest goal, is also to advance the implementation of the Paris Agreement, and it has internationally been agreed. Second, level of integration. When we talk, we all, we all say that forests cut across the three Rio Convention. It is not clear to me how forests is, is really taken into, into account. And I know that my big sister is here and we will not agree with me, but we need a genuine, a genuine integration of forests in those three Rio Convention for things to happen. Otherwise, you have uh, uh, the Convention on Biodiversity. I know that we work closely with CBD. You have uh, the, the UNCCD doing his stuff. You have also the uh, climate change. So we need to make sure that it is genuinely integrated. Thank you. Just one after the other, thank you. Okay, th thank you, Mario. I just wanted to compliment what Juliet has just said. The nexus between the positive contributions of sustainably managed forests and the climate change mitigation and adaptation also needs to be sealed. Juliet talked about integrating forests in the three conventions. I am saying within the specific convention on climate change, it needs to be further emphasized because otherwise the, the value of forests is lost. It needs to be acknowledged as a key contributor and a key element towards climate mitigation and adaptation. This will be down to parties in the room and also the communities at home in order to address one of our colleagues' uh, questions earlier. There needs to be active engagement between all stakeholders together with your government, you know. Sometimes, you know, governments, they, they attend all the, the negotiations and all the processes, but they fail to hear what their actual people wish to know or wish to hear. So many governments have started consultation processes and roundtables with their people, and perhaps this is something that our colleagues from Peru can push for. In order to address my great friend Pascal's questions, why the bottlenecks, the lack of progress, in addition to what Juliet said, I also said we need equitable access to the funding pools, particularly GEF and the GCF. Equitable, facilitated access so that there are more participants who can come forward with their national priorities in order to benefit from that. And this needs to be accompanied by fiscal and non-fiscal incentives for the countries themselves. And also within these mechanisms, there needs to be that in order to avoid or desist deforestation. I said earlier, if the forests are not showing their true value, it's a very simple answer as to what governments will do. We need a sustainable and healthy planet. It's a joint responsibility, solid collaboration, leaving no one behind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shim. And I see Elizabeth. <laughs>
Thank you very much. I'll try to respond uh, to the questions or comments raised uh, together. Why we have not achieved the results? If we look at the three Rio conventions, all of them celebrating 30 years this year, at the time they were negotiated, and today is completely different. Yes, they were negotiated as three different independent instruments because the knowledge of the issues at the time dictated that. But over the years, we have seen it, it clearly that you cannot separate between climate, land, and, uh, and biodiversity. Not surprising, 30 years later, now we are talking of that the three challenges are inseparable and solutions are common, and we need to look at all of them together. So we have learned the lesson, and the, and the recent events have even taught us more. Floods, to droughts, to wildfire, wildfires, heat waves. These are all happening on the land. They are not, although we talk is climate change, is climate change, are they happening in the air? So clearly, that climate change is exhibited by the loss of biodiversity, where these events, mostly man-made, are happening. So we, are, we have learned the lesson. And yes, we did not achieve yesterday, but I think with the lessons where we are heading, situation might be better. And this gets back to the question regarding alignment and uh, convergence of the three conventions. Questions have been raised whether we should have three COPs together at some point. And I've been answering, we cannot have three COPs because these are three legally binding separate instruments. To have them three COPs together, it means amending them. And this is not the time to do that. We can talk of having one conference looking at the three challenges to be able to identify those common solutions which cut across without linking them to COPs. So the COPs remain, but if then the three challenges are to be looked together, the outcome then can be brought to the independent COPs as part of that package. I think that's what I can say. Thank you. I think from my side, very little to be added, as my colleagues have said, but maybe to bring another perspective, which is a perspective of food security. We need to feed the world, and what we do, we cut trees to plant, as our, uh, uh, my sister from Ghana was expl uh, explaining, or we are in Ivory Coast, we cut trees to put cocoa. And what we, we have is an integrated approach, is how we can have win-win solutions. But something has, which has not been said, and I think is important, is the political will. Yesterday we were here listening to Lula, how he, can, he has changed completely the perspective regarding the Amazon. Is uh, the Amazon, how one leader, a political will, a vision, can transform something, and we need this. But we, ha we need also to avoid to be on the hands of our leaders. How, as, as citizens, will avoid that it will pass from one to another, that the decision has to be taken and to be implemented. And if not implemented, they will pay for that. And this is, I think, something is, is missing, this global and the political will to change and to turn deforestation. It's hard to add much to that. Um, you know, I would just building off the idea of the political will. You know, you, we need the political will. We get that when we have the right technical information, when we have science based policies, and when we have an engaged public. And uh, I think in having public that is aware, aware of the consequences of their decisions. Um, a public that understands and has the information that they need in order to be informed about um, where they're empowered to choose a deforestation-free product over, the, over a different alternative and what is the cost in real terms of those decisions. And we also have to ensure that young people are empowered both with the skill sets that they need for the jobs of the future and the information that they need today to be part of the strong voices for change. 
Uh, we just celebrated uh, this week the, the launch of the Green Jobs for Youth Pact, a uh, partnership of UNEP, ILO, and UNICEF together to ensure that education systems are including the information that young people are going to need in terms of the, the jobs of the future in the curriculum, that they're getting the skills they need for the jobs of the future, that they're being prepared, and that education systems themselves are aware of how their own infrastructure is role modeling sustainability in the practices that young people are absorbing while they go through their educational process. So whatever we can do to ensure that the public is part of an aware, informed, empowered process towards solutions makes everyone's job uh, more important. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, going, thank you, Susan, going to Donald, if, if your final tweets. Uh, thank you. Um, I only want to suggest one thing. If it is economically, socially, and financially more beneficial to preserve the forests, then the country, the businesses, the everybody will preserve them. In our view, that is the case. But we are the choir in the church. We are already believe. The question is, how do you get the others who are not members of the church to believe and do the same thing? Now, this is happening more and more. I mean, Ghana is a good example. It is spreading out. People are recognizing it is far more valuable to keep the forest and get paid every three years or so than to destroy it and have a limited income. Once this is the case, you don't need an international agreement to get them to preserve the forest. They're preserving it because it's in their own best interest. Um, so I welcome the positive direction that things are going. And I really enjoy the discussion on keeping the, all of the groups together and trying to move them at a faster pace. I don't think things should move at the same pace. They should all move at a faster pace. And we look forward to the recognition that $2 million from the GEF is not a measure of anybody's forest. $2 billion from the global community is a measure of somebody's forest. And that we target the correct value and make that why action is taken. Not money, but do you, as you know, value moves people in certain directions. Thank you. Many thanks, Donald. And uh, this brings this event uh, to an end. As we've heard, turning the tide on deforestation in the next 10 years is an imperative. We know it's complex, but it's also doable. It's a system change that requires everyone to work together. Radical collaboration. You have heard from the Collaborative Partnership on Forest and from the UN system uh, leadership that the multilateral system is ready, committed to support. And with this, I would like to thank everyone in the audience for the very rich discussion, all of the panelists, all of the speakers, Rosalind, everyone. It's been wonderful to be together. And uh, let's continue like this and faster. Thank you. <laughs>